Hello and welcome to our service as St James's Church in Rowledge. Wherever you're joining us from around the world, around the country or just around the corner, you are more than welcome as we worship God and as we hear uh, from God's word from Russ a little bit later. I hope you've had a really good week this week. Um, it is tough, isn't it, being in quarantine um, and being on lockdown, but of course it is absolutely necessary and I don't know about you, but my days have just been rolling into each other and I've been trying to do lots of different things, uh, but they've not always worked out as planned. And uh, your week may have looked a little bit like mine. Oh, yes. Where do you want to start? I guess at the beginning somewhere. It was a crazy beginning. One hour later. No, definitely, she definitely did it. It was all Carol Baskin. Celebrity News. Del. Del, love. What are you doing? What Why do I have to do an hour's exercise a day? Why, Boris? <sighs> yeah. Come on! Eight hours later. Of course, we all know that this is not the reality for a lot of people who are still going out to work very bravely uh, and keeping our country going. And those people, we would like to say thank you and we want to bless you as well. And so we do. We pray God's blessing over you, that he would keep you safe. He would keep you positive, um, that he would keep your families and friends safe as well as you are going out to work, whether it's in the, the care industry, um, in the NHS, in supermarkets or driving trucks. We just want to pray God's blessing over you. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start our service properly and we are going to um, say a prayer together. And Tess is going to lead us in this prayer, but it would be great if we could all join in at the same time. So the words will be up on the screen for you to join in with. So let's pray together. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. So we're going to sing our first song together now. And this is a brilliant song that you can get involved with with the actions. Beth is going to be showing you the actions as we go. And this song is called My Lighthouse. So wherever you are, um, get up if you can. Uh, get doing the actions, get jumping, get singing. Uh, let's use this as part of our daily exercise. Let's see if you can get those heart rates up while we praise God together. In my wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. See 
love that song and I hope you enjoyed that too. We are going to go straight into our next song. Now this song is um, quite special, it's quite retro in its way, um, but Thomas Night Noel is going to lead us in this song, but the lyrics are going to be up for you to join in with as well. It is Colours of Day. Hello. much Thomas for sending that in and if there's anybody else out there um, any children young people adults could be any of you who would like to lead us in a worship song um, that is special to you then please do let us know and um, you are welcome to send us a message on social media um, or to email us on this email address okay so what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from God's word and Steve Dean is going to bring us that and then Russ is going to speak to us from that Bible reading. The reading today is taken from Luke chapter 24, uh, beginning at verse 13, reading through to verse 35, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. 
They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels, who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb, and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things, and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was with them at the table, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. This is the word of the Lord. So as we come to this passage of uh, Luke's Gospel, let's pray. Lord God, we ask that you would reveal yourself to us today through the words of Scripture. We pray that you would open our eyes and that you would journey with us as we seek to know you better. Because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I, um, I love films. And I particularly like films about um, sort of fairly recent historical events. And one of the movies that I watched just a few weeks ago was a movie called Hidden Figures. And it's a true story of uh, black women working at NASA in the 1960s. And about how their work, uh, hidden away from the public eye in the field of mathematics, was instrumental in confirming the accurate trajectories for the rockets that would ultimately send man into space and obviously crucially to be able to bring uh, him home again and the film reminded me that um, if an object is traveling through space if it's shifted on its trajectory by even one or two degrees of arc as it continues off into space over time it will end up millions of light years from where it would otherwise have been and it made me think that sometimes we have days like that or, or events in our lives or significant meetings, significant conversations that set our lives on a new trajectory. The result being that years later we end up geographically or, or mentally or spiritually miles away from where we would have otherwise been if those encounters or conversations hadn't taken place. And I wonder if you can think of a day or an event or a conversation that changed the direction of your life. And I guess that the one that immediately comes to my mind was a relatively short journey, actually. It was a journey across a crowded courtyard on the first day of college term when I went over and sat with a group of other new students and struck up a conversation with a girl who I initially thought was an American. Uh, who had long hair and beautiful deep brown eyes and who turned out to be a Canadian uh, called Jenny and little did I know then that she would become my wife. A day, a meeting, a conversation that, that no doubt has changed the trajectory of my life. And today's Bible reading from Luke chapter 24 was a day like that. In fact it was a day like no other day because it was a day that set the entire world on a new trajectory because the worldwide Christian church of some two and a half billion people, the largest faith group on the planet, with all of its different expressions of church, all of its different ministries to the poor, the sick, the vulnerable, ministries of marriage and baptism and funerals, our, our different styles of worship, all of our beautiful heritage and buildings, our glorious cathedrals and colleges. The whole Christian faith is driven by, focused on, finds its hope in the events of one day. 
Uh, and that was that first Easter morning when a man called Jesus, who had been dead for three days, was seen alive again. It all focuses on an event in history. And today we're going to look at one of those encounters with this man who came back from the dead and how that meeting transformed the lives of two disciples. So if you have a Bible uh, nearby, I want to encourage you to open it and to turn to the verses that Steve has just read to us. And the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, right at the end of Luke's Gospel, and starting to read at verse 13. And although today, here in 2020, we are now two weeks after the events of Easter, the events of this passage happen on that same day, on that Easter day when Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Verse 13 says, later that same day. So we're on that, that Easter day. And the setting of this account is on the road that leads northwest from the city of Jerusalem to one of the outlying communities, uh, a place called Emmaus. And uh, here you can see the route uh, on Google Maps, as, as it is today, a journey of uh, about 10 miles by today's roads. But these disciples very likely walked a more direct route of about seven miles, probably three, three and a half hour walk. Uh, it would be like, for those of you who know Farnham, it would be like us walking perhaps from Farnham to Hindhead, if, if of course we were allowed to do that in this uh, strange way of life that we find ourselves. And I want us to see what happens on this relatively short journey because it is a journey of transformation. So let's look through this passage together. Verse 13 says that there were two of them, two of who? Well, two disciples, two disciples because the 11 disciples are referenced in the previous passage. And these two of them were going to Emmaus. And they leave Jerusalem confused, distraught, perhaps even angry that they had trusted in a man called Jesus as the saviour of the Jewish people, and yet he's been crucified. And worse still, now his body appears to have been stolen. And as they talk about the events of perhaps the last three years of following Jesus, and certainly the last three days, Jesus comes and walks alongside them, but they're kept from recognising him. I wonder why that might be, because it could be something as simple as uh, they're walking west towards the end of the day and perhaps the setting sun was in their eyes and they simply couldn't see him because of the setting sun. Maybe his face was covered, maybe uh, he had a, a face covering uh, against the wind or the sand, but I think it's more likely that they didn't recognise him because of where they were, uh, both spiritually and emotionally. Their friend and teacher of the last three years, as far as they are concerned, is dead. Their whole demeanour is one that our Bibles translates as downcast. At this stage in their journey, their focus is downward, is towards the ground, on the path. Their, their focus is on getting to Emmaus before it gets dark. They are turned downwards towards their earthly disappointments, rather than upwards towards heavenly possibilities, heavenly promises. And I wonder if for some of us, maybe for a lot of us, that's where our attention is at the moment. Our, our attention is, is solely focused on getting through this current situation, the lockdown. Certainly I know for me, uh, on some mornings, that's how it feels, that it's another day looking at the same four walls, reading the same bad news. But what about if we lift our eyes to see how God might be using this time of trial? I don't believe he's imposed it upon us, but I do believe that he can use even this time for our blessing and for our good. He's certainly reminding us, isn't he, of the importance of community. When that community is cut off from us, we know that we are community beings. We need to live in proximity to one another. We need to have physical contact and, and be able to shake hands and hug and kiss one another. And when that's taken away, it's hard. Certainly, I believe that God is showing us how quickly 
our environment starts to repair itself when we stop polluting it. So that's my first point really, that let's lift ourselves heavenward and focus on the face and the character of Jesus so that we don't miss what he's doing in our lives because our focus was downward, because he is with us on this journey. Jesus asks what these two disciples are discussing, to which they reply, I think, with surprise. Are you from out of town? You must be the only one who hasn't heard about what's been happening in Jerusalem over these last few days. And Jesus says, what things? Effectively, Jesus is saying, tell me the story from your perspective. Tell me where you're at in all of this. And it's a really good question. One that perhaps we might ask ourselves, where are we with God at the moment? Where are our lives at? And the disciples say that they, uh, what, had, what they'd been expecting to happen hasn't come to pass as far as they're concerned. They knew Jesus was a prophet and a teacher, but more than that, they had hoped that he would redeem, save Israel from the occupying Romans. But all these promises appear to have ended in nothing. They appear to have ended in crucifixion. And I wonder how often some of the great promises that have been made to us in our lives seem to come to nothing. Perhaps we might reflect on that for a few moments. But now there's this rumour from some of the women that Jesus' body is missing from the tomb. There's some story of angels and that Jesus is alive. Now these disciples are grieving. They're certainly confused. They're probably deeply disappointed that they haven't seen Jesus if he is still alive. And yet quite ironically, Jesus is standing beside them. And as they speak with Jesus, the, the old King James Bible translates Jesus' reply with these words, O oh, oh fools who art slow of, of heart and slow to believe. The Passion Translation of 2018 says, why are you so thick headed? Don't you remember all that you were taught about the Christ, about the Messiah, about the Saviour having to suffer before he entered into glory? And then as they walk, Jesus gives these men a Bible study to beat all Bible studies because he takes them back through the books of Moses and the prophets through what we would consider our Old Testament to explain how all of these writings point towards him, towards Jesus. Surely he would have read to them Genesis 22 where Abraham offers his only son as a sacrifice but God steps in and instead provides a sacrificial lamb, the lamb of God, we might say, one of the names of Jesus. Perhaps Jesus would have explained to them Numbers chapter 22, when God tells Moses to, to make out of bronze a snake and to raise that snake up on a wooden pole. And all the Israelites who had been, uh, who had sinned against God, were told that if they looked at the creature on the pole, symbolising God's word, God's command, then they would not perish, but they would live. And of course, when we look to the man on the tree, on the cross, then we're told that we will not perish, but that we will have life in all its fullness. I'm sure Jesus would have taken them through the, through, through the Psalms uh, and the scriptures such as Psalm 16, which says, you are my Lord and apart from you, I have no good thing. You will not abandon me to the grave nor will you let your Holy One see decay. Or maybe Psalm 22 that predicts, and this is 600 years before Christ's life, predicts that a band of evil men has encircled me, they have pierced my hands and feet, they divide my garments among them, they cast lots for my clothing. Exactly what happened to Jesus, whose hands and feet were pierced, whose clothes and garments were divided among the Roman soldiers. And I'm certain that he would have taken them through the prophecies of Isaiah and particularly chapter 53. Again, this is 500 years before the life of Jesus. 
but where we read these powerful words. Isaiah 53 verses 3 to 6. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and we looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole. He was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, on Jesus, the sins of us all. So you see, as Jesus takes them on this Bible study, as they walk towards Emmaus, we see that Jesus points to himself on every page of the Old Testament. The Old Testament points us to the new, to the coming of Jesus. Statistically, uh, the probability of one man independently and simultaneously fulfilling even 10 prophecies made about that man's life, and I have to read this, is one in 16,425 septenquadratillion. Okay, now that is one in 16,425 with 47 zeros behind it. Those are the chances of one person fulfilling even 10 prophecies about them. And you might know that there are more than 10 prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. In fact, there are 300 prophecies about his birth, life, ministry, and death. So all of that to say really that Jesus revealed himself to these disciples through the words of scripture. When we look to the word of God in the presence of the Holy Spirit, the true character of Jesus will be revealed to us and we will be guided through our life, we'll be corrected, we'll be inspired, we'll be given new hope. So that's my second point really, that our Bibles are like soap. The Bible has the power to cleanse and renew us, but only if it's opened and liberally applied to our lives. And I would suggest that if you want help reading the Bible, then let me recommend the Bible in one year. Uh, it's, a, it's an app, it's a website, you can buy it as a book, uh, but it just takes you through some passages of scripture each day so that in the course of a year you'll have read the whole thing. It doesn't start at the first page, but it starts uh, and, and takes you through scripture in a really helpful way. And then finally, at the end of this journey, Jesus appears to carry on along the path without them. But they invite him to stay with them for, for a meal. And the words used are that they urged him to stay. They'd been so inspired by what he'd shared with them, even though they still as yet didn't recognise who he was. And so they invite Jesus to come to their home and to have a meal with them. And when they did, Jesus breaks bread with them, which was actually the role of the host. But Jesus is saying, I am the host, I am the master. And he offers the bread to them. The symbolism surely being that he has offered himself for them. Jesus is the bread of life. And at that moment, they see who Jesus really is. And that's my final point. You see, Jesus doesn't force himself into our lives. He waits for us to invite him. And when we do, he comes into our lives in such a way that our hearts will be set on fire with love for him. The disciples say, didn't our hearts burn within us? As we realise that he has offered his life for ours. He is the bread of life who feeds and nourishes us. For these two disciples, this has been a journey like no other. But I would suggest that more than a physical or geographical journey, this is a faith journey. Because the journey that's taken place is actually a journey of about 24 inches or 60 centimetres in new money because it's the journey from head understanding, academic knowledge, if you like, to heart transformation. It's a journey that we all need to make from simply an academic understanding of who God is 
to a heart transformation in our own lives. So today, will you lift your eyes from the gloom and lift your eyes towards heaven? Will you allow Jesus to reveal himself to you on the journey of your life through his living word, which I promise has the power to heal and transform? Will you invite him into your life, into a relationship today and allow him to offer himself for you? If you do, the trajectory of your life will never be the same again. Amen. Thank you, Russ. There's a lot to think about there and to help us have a think and to reflect on what Russ was saying, I'm going to hand over to Beth now, who will be doing an activity that you can do either in your own house or maybe out on your walk or in your garden. So we have been thinking about the road to Emmaus and Jesus journeying with the disciples as they discover new things about Jesus and about their faith. So we thought it'd be really cool if you guys could go uh, and do a little prayer walk. If you can go outside, go to the park, go for a little walk um, or you can go to different rooms in your house or like me you can go into your garden if you have one and just find different things that might help you remember the different times God's really uh, shown you his love the different points in your faith journey and um, think about the maybe the prophecies of the Old Testament that Jesus was talking about to the disciples in our story today or look at the different parts of the story to help you on your prayer walk um, one example of something that I find really helpful to remember on my faith journey is, um, I don't know if you can see, but right there are some really pretty bluebells that my mum planted, my lovely mum. And for me, bluebells are a really big thing in my faith journey because when I was about 17 or 18, um, I went to a wood that was full of bluebells and I haven't felt God's presence that strongly ever before then. And I just felt like he was walking right next to me and I spent hours walking around that woods and I felt my relationship with Jesus grow so much stronger that day after just chatting with him through this blue old wood. So every time I see bluebells and especially the ones in my garden, it reminds me of that point in my faith journey and how God really showed up for me when I needed him and really showed me how much he loves me. So you can do that you can go into your garden find things that might help you remember bits of your own faith journey maybe you already have things in your house that help you remind yourself of your own faith journey you can go on a walk and as you think about different things um, in your own faith journey maybe you can pick things up that will help you one day to remember these different parts of your faith journey and um, if you do this and you'd like to share with us um maybe some bits you picked up or different parts of your faith journey please do we'd love to hear some stories because it's always nice to encourage each other and share these amazing times uh in our faith and between us and god and the way jesus turns up for us so i hope you guys have fun and really enjoy this meaningful experience so we really want to encourage you to do think about your own faith story and how what was said earlier um, about Jesus walking with us on our journey um, and how that affects you. And we're actually going to um, have a song from Jenny now and we're going to use this song as and use the time um, to have a look around your house, have a walk around your house, so just as you're listening to the music and to the lyrics. Um, and maybe you could take this with you on your daily walk as well and just use this song to reflect about your own faith story and um, to see what other things there are around your house or on your daily exercise and um, to help you recognise where Jesus has been walking alongside you. Every day 
time of prayer now and this is going to be led by one of our young people Matthew 
and if you feel that you would like to pause uh, the video after Matthew has led us in our prayers to offer up your own um, prayers of worship, praise and supplication, then please do that um, after we've said the Lord's Prayer together. When I say the words, God of love, please respond with hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for the key workers who are keeping this country going. We ask that you would protect them and give them strength as they look after our loved ones and provide essential services. God of love, hear our prayer. Father God, we lift up those who are facing illness today. We ask that you will bring healing, comfort and peace to their bodies. Calm their anxiety and let them lo know your love. God of love, hear our prayer. God of hope, in these times of uncertainty, unite our nation and guide leaders with your wisdom. Give us courage to overcome our fears and help us build a future in which all may propose and share. God of love, hear our prayer. We pray for those wrongly imprisoned or held captive, for those trying to secure their release, that the ways of peace and diplomacy may prevail over acts of violence and aggression, that their capitals may know a change of heart. Through him who was sent to proclaim liberty for captives and set free those who are oppressed. God of love, hear our prayer. As we join all our prayers into one, let's say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our service today. Um, I hope you enjoyed yourself. Thank you to all those who were involved. We're going to sing our final song now, which is called This I Believe. And that's going to be followed by Helena, who is going to be giving us our blessing for today. So thanks once again for joining us and we hope to see you next week.
gentle night to you. Moon and stars pour their healing light on you. Deep peace of Christ, the light of the world to you. Deep peace of Christ to you. <laughs> 